Today's video is brought to you by Vincero. Hey brother! Lightning bending. Possibly the coolest form of bending we see in all of Avatar. It is first introduced into the show at the beginning of season two when you see Azula blasting it out of her royal fingertips. This combined with her signature blue fire marks her as an immediately and immensely dangerous adversary. Like I remember thinking to myself like, whoa, did she just shoot lightning? Is that allowed? Is that even? F is that a fire? Last I checked, Jolteon and Flareon, different Pokemon, that's all I'm saying. But it's a skill that innately lets you know that this is someone of extreme ability, like leagues above any other firebender we have seen thus far. Like, hey, remember last season when Aang merged with the spirit of the ocean and became a giant koi fish water monster that took out an entire fire navy fleet at once and he basically looked invincible? Yeah, well, never mind. This girl can shoot lightning and suddenly Aang looks awful beatable again. Especially since Aang spends most of that episode deciding that he doesn't want to go into the Avatar state anymore. Yeah, right Aang. Okay, we all know how this season's gonna go. You're gonna stand on your moral high ground and the lightning bending will give Azula the edge for most of the season, but eventually push will come to shove. You're gonna have to enter the Avatar state and oh my god she killed him! Yeah, sorry Aang's ace in the hole. Meet lightning. The most advanced, dangerous, only available to the royal elite season ending bending. Until that is Legend of Korra where I'm I'm sorry, what is this? what is this? Are those just regular Joe Schmo firebenders shooting lightning out of their very non-royal fingertips? What, like how did this happen? How did the coolest ability that defined the best villain of the original series that was a mark of her mastery become so commonplace? Well, today we find out. Guys, before we dive on in, I need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Vincero. Guys, the holidays are just around the corner, and if you were looking for a really solid gift choice or just something new for yourself, you have got to check out Vincero watches. They have been a longtime supporter of the channel, and Ben and I truly wear their watches every day. They have an amazing collection for both men and women, and my personal favorite right now is called the Outrider. It has this really cool rustic look that you can either dress up or or down. Also, the watches can be engraved in case you're looking to add a little extra personal touch to your gift this year. Also, also, they just wrap really well. Like everything from Vincera comes in this really great packaging that's just like it's a pleasure to open. Vincera watches are exceptionally crafted, sustainably made modern watches at an affordable price with free shipping. So be sure to head over to vincerawatches.com slash SCB sale to get 15% off your entire order. Again, that is vincerawatches.com slash SCB sale to get 15% off of your order. Link is in the description down below. Okay, so let's just start with the basics. What is lightning bending and why is it so rare? Well, according to Iroh, there are two kinds of energy that surrounds everybody, yin and yang, or positive and negative. And if you separate the two, you create an imbalance which the energy naturally seeks to restore. And when the bender who has separated the two brings them crashing back together, it creates lightning which they can then redirect as they see fit. And it sounds simple enough, right? Except that Iroh also throws in this just tiny little caveat. Only a select few firebenders can separate these energies. And I think it is that line right there that is the cause of so much confusion because despite Iroh saying this in all of his wisdom, we still see in Legend of Korra, a factory full of lightning benders. So the short answer is that lightning bending becomes common as a result of economic development and the industrial revolution, not because of a a widening of the genetic pool of available potential lightning benders. See, here's the thing. While Iroh is incorrect when he suggests that only a special select few firebenders who've won the bending lottery are able to shoot lightning, he is factually correct that at that moment in time, only a select few benders can actually do it. Those few being himself, Ozai and Azula. But that's it. That's the full list of people who are capable of lightning bending during the show. And do you know what all three of them happen to have in common? They are members of the royal family. 
But again, it's not genetics or their royal blood that gives them this ability. The important part is that they are at the highest level of the social hierarchy within the Fire Nation. Or, well, they were before Iroh got all like banished and stuff. But I mean, what are the odds, right? I mean, it just so happens that the select few firebenders who can lightning bend also happen to be the richest people in the entire world? Yeah, this is no coincidence. It's the same reason why out of every member of the Fire Nation, every citizen, every soldier in the Fire Army, Ozai, the Fire Lord, is the best firebender in the world. Like, think about that. How often is your political leader also the literal best soldier in the country? And it makes sense. The identity of their nation is literally derived from their bending. It's literally called the Fire Nation. And their nation, especially under Ozai's rule, is defined by power. And as such, the higher up the government or the military you go, the greater you can expect the bending to be. Which no, doesn't mean like if you're better at fire bending, you just immediately move further up the government. It just means that the higher up you are, the more resources you have to become better at fire bending. So really it is no shock at all that the secret of lightning bending is kept within specifically the royal family. Because bending lightning would not just be a representative representation of your political power, but it is literally power coming out of your hands. That said, you might be wondering, well, couldn't other people also just discover it though? Like if they saw someone else do it, couldn't they like work backwards and try and figure it out for themselves? Well, yes, that's true. But even that is pretty uncommon because one, it is still really hard to do even if you know how to do it. Two, demonstrations of it are extremely uncommon. And three, it's really not that useful. And that's really the big one because while being able to shoot lightning is undeniably cool, outside of combat, there's really not much use for that ability, at least pre-industrial revolution. It's difficult to do, it's dangerous to try, and even if you can, so what? I mean, if anything, you might have just marked yourself as a threat. And I mean that because you might be wondering, uh, well, gee, if this is such a deadly ability, why doesn't the Fire Lord train his entire army to be able to do this? Wouldn't that give them the edge to finally end this hundred year war? Yeah, probably. That probably would have worked. But here's the thing about tyrants. They are always afraid of the people they are suppressing. And if Ozai was the kind of person who could trust his army with this skill, he wouldn't be the kind of person who became a tyrant in the first place. So in summary, lightning bending, not super useful, definitely mostly a sign of status, but also a pretty heavily guarded secret, which is why the skill remains extremely rare outside of the literal highest echelon of society. Until, society needs that skill. Okay, so one of my favorite things about Avatar is seeing how the fact that each nation is defined by its bending has impacted their culture and economy and the way they develop technology. And I would say that in three out of the four nations, the fact that they can bend has really more halted the development of their technology. It's not that they don't have it, but it's almost always tied back to the bending. For example, the water tribes live at the poles, not because it's comfortable or easy, but because they can control literally everything around them. They're able to make use of canals, but they control it by bending. They have a really strong navy, but it's not because they have super advanced ships, it's because they're on the water. Omashu uses bending and gravity to send the packages all over the city. Ba Sing Se actually has something of a monorail system, but it doesn't run on anything other than bending. And the Air Nomads, well, man, they they do not care. They uh, they make gliders. Does that count? Those are, those are cool. And have you seen the lock on this door? Like, look at that, woo, marvel at the wizardry. The Fire Nation, on the other hand, are like, okay, what can we do with fire? We can uh, cook food, that's good, that's good. But also let's build stuff like big metal boats and tanks and machines that run 
on fire. I mean, it's not like you can't make energy with the other elements, but fire literally is energy. And as such, the Fire Nation is way more technologically advanced than the other nations, which is what leads them to such a time of extreme prosperity where somebody wants to share it with the rest of the world. We should share this prosperity with the rest of the world. Yeah, it's not a horrible sentiment, but he doesn't really mean share, does he? He more means do everything I say and then maybe, maybe you can play with my toys. Probably not. If it's advantageous to me, maybe then, but mostly do what I say or else. On the flip side though, as soon as the war to share everything with everyone else is over, Zuko becomes the Fire Lord and immediately just shares everything with everyone else. It's almost like the war. Was pointless. But as it turns out, some people were already sharing. Specifically, the areas of the Earth Kingdom that the Fire Nation had colonized in the very early days of the war. Which was not a cool thing to do, but a hundred years later, they have pretty much just accepted the new way of life. Earth and Fire Nation citizens just living together, and a lot of them were very happy about it. In fact, Team Avatar actually goes in and tries to re-separate them, and they don't want that. So instead, they actually unite all of these colonies into the United Republic of Nations, a fifth country for the world. And it's meant to serve as a haven for immigrants from all four nations, and they establish Republic City as the capital city, and that is where most of Legend of Korra takes place. And this mixture of cultures combined with the technology from the Fire Nation creates a booming industrial revolution. They actually look into the origins of this in the comic series The Rift, but in a nutshell, here's how it goes down. It starts with a factory called the Earth and Fire Refinery. Huh? Get it? Which is actually founded by Toph's father. And apparently it's the world's first ever international business venture, which like, are you seriously telling me no two people from different countries have ever started a business together before then? Because if so, yeah, sure. But the factory produces a lot of jobs for non-benders and benders of different elements alike. And as more families move there to work at the factory, a whole village pops up around it, which then leads to more factories and more jobs and more families and more factories and more people and Republic City. Interestingly though, as the machines in the factories became more and more developed, the need for benders became less and less. And largely they started being let go because they could demanded more wages and employers started favoring non-benders instead. And that eventually causes this whole bender supremacy uprising, which Team Avatar has to go in there and quell, but I'll let you read that whole story for yourself. But eventually that gets sorted and as manufacturing booms, the city grows and grows and needs more power in the form of electricity. And that is where suddenly lightning bending becomes an extremely valuable economic commodity. And boy, oh boy, will nothing drive forward the development of a skill or product like the demand from the market. Just look off our face masks will come. And that is why suddenly the secret is out. There is a reason to try and risk learning how to lightning bend. Hey, I found some work down at the power plant. Made some decent money. This is why it is no longer reserved for the royal elite, but is instead embraced by the masses on factory floors. But whatever, as far as I'm concerned, Azula would still kick all of their non-royal butts in a fight. Even you, Mako. <laughs> Guys, quick announcement that this Friday night, November 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern, we are gonna be having another trivia night right here on the channel on YouTube. And we are going to be unveiling our brand new animal mugs for Carlin Brothers Coffee. You guys have been asking for them all year. Last year, they sold out insanely quickly, but we have brand new models, which we'll be unveiling during the stream on Friday, plus another little charming announcement. But I'm gonna keep that one a secret. You have to tune in to find out. Hope to see you there. But Ben, my question for you and everyone else is, what is your favorite sub bending style? Let me know in the towel section down below. Thanks as always for watching today's video. Don't forget to leave a like on it if you haven't already and subscribe so you don't miss any future Avatar action from us. If you want to see why Ty Lee is almost definitely an air nomad, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, until next week, I will see you in another life, brother.